Hello, let's start with a lockdown story. During April 2020, more than half the world's population reduced their travel by at least half. 80% of the population in one data set of uh, major countries reduced their travel by more than half. That was really good news for tackling a climate crisis. As carbon dioxide emissions also fell. The UK, for example, saw a 36% overall decline in carbon emissions, a 60% fall in emissions from passenger vehicles, the carbon source most difficult uh, to tackle. And it wasn't just carbon emissions, nitrous oxides, the pollutant most strongly linked to re respiratory irritation and damage, also fell significantly. 62% drop in Edinburgh, 54% in Paris, 50% in London, Madrid, Milan, Rome. Airborne particulates, the other major contributor to premature death and long-term damage, also fell. In the photograph here from New York, 59% reductions were, were felt in air pollution. The scale of change can be seen in many places. This chart just gives a, a dramatic shot, uh, shot of how rapidly it falls. And this was taken in a study that was designed to show whether it was the, the reduction in traffic or the meteorological conditions that caused the fall in pollutants. Well, the result was it was the reduction in traffic. But it, not only was the air better, but when motor traffic decreased, the streets left felt safer for many. Families felt confident enough to go out together on their bikes and walking on quiet city streets now devoid of car traffic. Active mobility took first priority and many cities began to intervene to make it easier and more pleasant to walk and to cycle. Four months later, well, levels of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions are back to little less than they were before. Some cities risk becoming even more polluted because public transport journeys are being replaced by car travel again. The changes witnessed during lockdown restrictions risk being only a very temporary blip in the upward trajectory of airborne pollutants. So what can we learn from the changes witnessed? How might we recapture those gains? I see two very important lessons in what's been amount, what's effectively been in a an unprecedented, though unwanted, global experiment in change. Firstly, the effects of lockdown and the measurements made make clear and viable the centrality of, uh, clear and visible rather, the centrality of motor vehicle traffic in the climate crisis and in the degradation of human health that comes with the other airborne pollutants that come alongside it. And second, but more importantly than the bad news, is that it makes visible the possibilities of change. We knew already that the transport sector accounts for uh, one third of our total GHG emissions in the UK. Well, rebuilding the economy in ways that recapture the gains made uh, during lockdown could put us back on target to meet our aspirations shared in Paris to keep the global temperature down below two degrees centigrade. And also, to do this requires some serious planning. As pointed out in the scientific advice to the 2019 UN Conference on Climate Change, because of the slow progress made so far, we're going to need to triple our ambitions stated there. But intervening in the transport sector in the way we've seen is just one way that we can begin to do that. So what are the solutions? The first one, replacing combustion vehicles with electrically powered vehicles. It's of an important part of the solutions, but it's only a tiny part. Transitions to electric vehicles will require substantial increases in energy production, as the energy provided by petroleum products has to be substituted by new electrical generation. And if it's, not to be, if it's to be any meaningful for greenhouse gas mitigation, then that's going to have to be a, a further increase in renewables. Current uh, renewable energy production really is only aimed at replacing uh, existing demand, not at meeting uh, vastly increased demand. And the second problem, of course, is that while they may be zero tailpipe emissions, they are, there are still damages to human health from 
airborne particulates from tyre and uh, braking degradation. So electric vehicles are part of the solution, but only a part. Second solution is to replace those short distance car trips. Because for most, most car journeys, 56% or more are less than five miles. The, tire, <coughs> the, the smallest, the largest car use is just for short journeys. Only 20% of car journeys are over 10 miles. So most car use is for very, very short distances. In fact, 40% of car trips are actually under two miles. So cycling and walking is an obvious, simple solution for those uh, short distance journeys. But translating that into possibility m requires two really important things. One, cycles appropriate to the journeys made, and two, safe and secure conditions in which to use them. Let's take the second one first because it's probably the, uh, the more dramatic. Fears around safety and security are repeatedly cited in academic studies as the primary barriers to travel by bike. Those fears stem not from the act of cycling itself but from having to mix with large and the risks posed by larger, heavier, faster vehicles. Mixing with something that could potentially kill you all the time with a slight, uh, slightest deviation is, of course it's scary, of course it creates feelings of vulnerability. But there are solutions that are straightforward and obvious, separate, separating car traffic from, uh, from cycle traffic. And remove, if you're reducing the volume of car traffic, then you free up space to do so. And in some areas of town centres, and, and city centres, motor traffic can easily be eliminated except for deliveries and, by specific, at, and at specific times of day and for most essential, uh, some essential journeys. And of course those deliveries can be made uh, by electric vehicle. These interventions provide feelings of security, safety of travel and protection for those walking and cycling. Properly designed, well-planned interventions can't only, don't only provide a secure environment, but they increase the, the livability of cities. They make them more pleasant. Poorly planned infrastructure, on the, on the other hand, is, can be destructive, can be really problematic. But the having, having those safe spaces is only part of the solution. The second element for no low-carbon mobility futures is the diversity of bike designs. Cycles take a variety of shapes and forms. Only rarely is the mountain bike or road racing bike that dominates sales and advertising in the UK an appropriate vehicle for travelling. For most everyday short journeys, you need something that's going to carry luggage, carry people, that's going to be practical. Or if you're commuting a longer distance, something that's uh, possibly an e-bike that can go a little bit quicker or go for further without having to fatigue you. In Copenhagen today, 26% of families with two or more children own a cargo bike to get around with. Businesses buy them to replace uh, the vehicles, that they, the vans that they used to use. Because they offer savings in cost, they offer savings in operation, and of course they can get deliveries any time without having to be restricted uh, to, to, to a very early morning and very late. Dutch style town bikes, luggage carrying cargo bikes, folding cycles for intermodal journeys when you're going on public transport as well. They all serve to different purposes and as part of a, an ecology of different, different bikes. They also provide different options for different family types, different journey types. Electric assisted e-bikes allow for not only longer distances, but also a wider range of people. They're very widely used now across the continent with, uh, by older riders who kind of just don't feel that they can quite, quite cope. So all of these have grown to be over 50% of the sales now. In some, Northern, in some Northern European countries. And that's without any of the uh, subsidy programmes that have gone around uh, to promote electric vehicles. What they all have the capacity to do is to make those short distance driving journeys 
the majority, let's remember, of car journeys, absolutely redundant. Now, of course, we can't do, uh, make the changes in the built environment by our individual actions, but local authorities will have to meet the demand ultimately to get those to get those changes implemented and to put the changes in place. So it's not a case of saying me saying to you, don't use a car or you can't have a car, but what is your journey really about? Does it really require you to use a car in it? Let's work together to see what the, that can do because we've seen the potential for carbon savings within uh, a shift in traffic. So thank you very much for listening and go safely.